Good morning and welcome to Walking with Jesus Through the Word, one chapter per day. I am Pastor Jason Van Bemmel from Forest Hill Presbyterian Church. It's day 301, and that brings us to 1 Corinthians 11. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for just waking us up, giving us another day of life, gathering us together around your word that we can study and grow in you. We pray that you would be our teacher and that you would write your word on our hearts. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Now, I commend you because you remember me in everything and maintain the traditions even as I delivered them to you. But I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ, the head of a wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. But every wife who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head since it is the same as if her head were shaven. For if a wife will not cover her head, then she should cut her hair short. But since it is disgraceful for a wife to cut off her hair or shave her head, let her cover her head. For a man ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. For man was not made from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. That is why a wife ought to have a symbol of authority on her head, because of the angels. Nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor man of woman. For as woman was made from man, so man is now born of woman. And all things are from God. Judge for yourselves. Is it proper For a wife to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not nature itself teach you that if a man wears long hair, it is a disgrace for him? But if a woman has long hair, it is her glory, for her hair is given to her for a covering. If anyone is inclined to be contentious, we have no such practice, nor do the churches of God. But in the following instructions, I do not commend you. Because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and I believe it in part, for there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another goes drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. For I receive from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, You proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever, therefore, eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined, so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so that when you come together, it will not be for judgment. About the other things, I will give directions when I come.
come. Hmm. That is God's holy word in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And this is a this is a difficult and thorny chapter. It's one of those that frankly is challenging for us to be able to handle in our morning devotional time in a quick 10-minute devotional message because I preach several sermons through this chapter. So what I'm going to do is direct you to those sermons as resources for deeper study. Now, if you don't know where to find sermons, the easiest place to find them is on sermonaudio.com. And on Sermon Audio, you will find, um, if you go to sermonaudio.com slash PCA, this is the easiest way to get there, Forest Hill PCA. And that'll bring us up. You'll see our church name at the top there. And then you go to sermons and then you filter. See this thing below sermons, it says filter and you filter by scripture. And then the scripture you want is 1 Corinthians. And then after that, the chapter you want is chapter 11. So if you go to 1 Corinthians 11, you'll see that there are three 45 minute long sermons on this chapter. Heads, headship, and the covering of Christ, head coverings and heavenly hosts, and the Lord's Supper. And I would just encourage you to go and look at those uh, at those sermons that I preached in 2020, because we're not going to have time to go over every detail. So with that little plug for your further study and consideration, let's see what we can do quickly here. So the Bible teaches very clearly male headship that, and it should really be husband headship because it's not the case that every man is the head of every woman. Part of what is difficult about this passage is the ambiguity in how we translate these Greek words. The Greek word for man is the same as the Greek word for husband, and the Greek word for woman is the same as the Greek word for wife. So man and husband, they don't have two different words, it's just the male word. And wife and woman, they don't have two different words, it's just the female word. And so sometimes it's unclear as to how to translate that. The ESV, I think, does a good job. The head of a wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. So it's not that every man is to lord over every woman. The Bible never teaches that. The Bible also teaches the full equality of men and women because we are created both in the image of God, male and female, we bear God's image, and we have equal worth and dignity. Headship has to do with responsibility and role relationships. So how we work together as husband and wife. And the husband as prophet, priest, and king in the home, as the head of his family, has a role responsibility to provide for and protect his wife. So he is her head to provide and protect, to shepherd her, to love her, to cherish her. And this creates a relationship between men and women. So the Bible is very clear that men and women are different, that there is male and female, and that that's created by God and there's no other categories and that when a husband and wife get married they become one flesh and it's a partnership of equals but that the husband has headship where he is to protect and provide for his wife and so what Paul is really getting at here is when we go to church and we worship together that ought to be evident it ought to be evident that this wife is with this husband and this husband is the head of this wife and so they had head coverings that were the cultural expression of that in the ancient world. That if a woman didn't have her head covered, it kind of communicated that she was available, that she didn't have a husband, that she might be looking, right? That's not appropriate. So modesty, decorum, and also sitting with your husband and learning together. That's going to come up in 1 Corinthians 14. And so this is actually, to have husband and wife sitting together, you know, is actually an elevation of women from the way things had been done. To this day in Orthodox Jewish synagogues, the men sit and learn and the women sit outside the circle and kind of listen in, but they don't ask any questions and they're not actually really engaged in the learning. Same thing in a Muslim synagogue, the men sit and learn and the women sort of sit outside that circle and sort of listen in, 
but mostly they're just there to wait for their husbands. So this is men and women learning together, men and women uh, engaged in worship together. Now, there are some things that are said here that are creational about a woman having long hair, it's her glory. If a man has long hair, it's a disgrace. I think that has to do with the fact that men are to be men and women are to be women. Like the Bible doesn't support cross-dressing or, or trans stuff. Like none of that's in the Bible. Uh, men are supposed to look like, dress like, act like men. Women are to look like, dress like, and act like women. And the Bible is very clear about male and female. And so that is to be reflected in how we worship. And we are not to create turmoil by being, you know, rebels against God's creational pattern of male and female. But it's a relationship between equals, to be very clear about that. The second part of what he talks about largely in 1 Corinthians 11 is the Lord's Supper. Now, the Lord's Supper in the early church was practiced differently than it is in any church today. And that is you had the breaking of the bread and the sharing of the cup in the context of a large meal. Uh, some people have called it the agape feast. So there would be the breaking of the bread, sharing in that as the body of Christ, and there'd be the sharing of the cup as the blood of Christ. But then there would also be this, this meal, this sharing of a feast together. And the problem in Corinth is they were so divided into different factions. There's a lot of, there's dripping irony and sarcasm in uh, verses 18 and 19, where Paul says, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and I believe it in part, for there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. Like, the super spiritual ones were saying, well, we're here first. We're the most eager to partake in this fellowship meal with Christ because we are the super spiritual ones. And it may be that people are coming in late because maybe they're a household slave. And maybe they had to attend to their duties at home before they could get away. Or maybe they're a wife whose husband is not a believer and she has to, you know, in the Roman culture, she would have to be permitted to leave by her husband and so she would not necessarily have been able to come just whenever she wanted to. And the people who got there on time and who were the super spiritual ones, they were eating and drinking everything, even to the point of getting drunk. And other people come in and there's no more food. That's not right. That's not loving. That doesn't express unity in the body of Christ. So the unity in the body of Christ is expressed by one bread, which we looked at in chapter 10, because there's one loaf, you're one body in Christ. It's not necessarily about one cup. Some churches have made a big deal about there being one cup and everybody drinking out of the common cup. The Bible actually doesn't use that language. In chapter 10 that we looked at a few days ago, it does use the language that there's one bread, and so we're one body, because we're one body. And so having different little cups for you know, hygiene purposes or whatever is, is perfectly fine. We do that at Forest Hill, as most of you know. But the one bread is the unity. But it's unity in how we partake. At Forest Hill, we picture this by everyone partaking together. So we distribute the element of the bread, and then we all eat together. And we distribute the element of the, of the, of the wine or grape juice, some people choose, and we partake together. And what we are doing is we are participating in fellowship, communion with the Lord. The Lord's Supper is called the Lord's Supper because it was the Lord Jesus Christ who instituted it, and he is both the host and the feast of the supper. So it is the Lord's Supper. But it could also be rightly called a Eucharist. Eucharist comes from the word Eucharisto, which means I give thanks, because it's a giving of thanks for the body and blood of Christ. It can also be rightly called communion because we're sharing in communion together with Christ. So any of those terminologies, Lord's Supper, Eucharist, communion, are all perfectly fine and valid ways to do it. We, we prefer the term Lord's Supper because we think that communicates best the fact that it is the Lord's table and not the table of Forest Hill Presbyterian Church or the PCA. It is, it is for those who belong to the Lord, and, it, and the Lord is the one who truly is the host serving us, and what he is serving us is himself. Now, it's not the physical body and blood of Christ that we're being fed. It is, it is our spirits, our souls, 
that are feasting upon Christ's body and blood by faith, because it is faith that we need, and we need the righteousness of Christ, we need the peace of Christ, we need the forgiveness of Christ applied to our souls to cleanse us of all of our sin and iniquity and to strengthen us where we are doubting and wavering. So we are given Christ for our souls to feed upon by faith, even as we eat the bread and drink the cup. Now, to do that, you have to be a believer. If you are not a believer and you're just going through the motions because you think it's the thing to do or it's a nice little snack or you just wanted to come and have a meal, like this is totally inappropriate because it is a communion of fellowship with Christ for those who belong to him. So Paul says there's two requirements. A person must examine himself and must discern the body. Examining himself, eat the bread and drink the cup, means we look at our hearts and we see our need for Jesus. We see our sin, our guilt, our weakness, our inadequacy. But we also see that there's faith there to trust in Jesus to be the sufficiency for those things. And to discern the body means that we see that Jesus Christ is our righteousness and our peace and our redemption, and that the body of Christ, the church, is our true spiritual family. So we examine ourselves, we discern the body, and we partake. If we don't do that, if we don't trust in Christ, if we don't really think we need Christ, if we don't really treasure the body of Christ with us eating together, then we're not eating properly. And we should refrain or we should repent before we partake. So that is the Lord's Supper. And again, for more detail on these things, please do take time to watch or listen to the sermons that I did. But if you have any questions, uh, this is one of those cases where there may be a lot of questions that come up from this chapter. Feel free to email me. My email address is pastor at foresthillpca.org. That's pastor at foresthillpca.org. Um, or you can comment on Facebook if you're on there um, or on YouTube and I'd be happy to respond to those comments or to the emails. So if you want a public answer, you can put it in a public comment. If you want a private answer, you can send me a private email. I'd be happy to correspond with you about any questions you have about anything in God's Word, but I know this is a particularly tricky chapter, so I want to offer that today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Jesus Christ, who is our head, who is our protector and provider and who is our righteousness and our peace and our eternal life. We have everything we need in Jesus. He is the all-sufficient one, the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. The sum and substance of our entire lives is found in Christ. We thank you for him. We pray that you would strengthen our faith in Jesus, cause us to follow after him more closely and more lovingly today than ever before. We pray this, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, that's 1 Corinthians 11. We are going to be jumping back to Joshua tomorrow, picking up with Joshua chapter 7. Have a blessed day in the Lord.